So today, we celebrate the promotion of Dr. Gino Summers to professor. Gino obtained his medical degree and did his residency training in Australia. He obtained his PhD from the University of Melbourne, also in Australia. He then moved to Canada and joined the Hospital for Six Children's in 2005 as a pediatric pathologist and clinical investigator. He currently is Division Head of Pathology at SickKids. He is serving as president of the Society for Pediatric Pathology, an international society. Gino is very interested in wellness and serves as a member of the Physician Peer Support Program at the Hospital for Sick Children. He is co-lead of the wellness portfolio in LMP. And you may recognize his name because he's been writing some of the wellness tips you've been receiving recently. On a personal note, Gino has two children, one at Queen's University doing engineering and the other at Trent University doing child and youth studies. In his spare time, Gino likes to cycle, walk and listen to jazz. Gino was promoted on the basis of creative professional activity based on his internationally recognized academic activities in pediatric sarcomas. He has built a translational research program focused on investigating disease biology and the development of diagnostic assays for pediatric sarcomas. He, together with his collaborators, identified a novel round cell sarcoma subtype in pediatric patients that is important in defining treatment options. And he was involved in the development of the first diagnostic assay for pediatric sarcomas. His achievements were lauded by his referees and one described him, and I quote, an innovator for the discovery of new therapeutically targetable pathways in pediatric soft tissue sarcomas, a field at the cutting edge of science in the diagnosis and treatment of pediatric neoplasias. In recognition of his achievements, Gino was promoted to the rank of professor on July 1st, 2020. Please join me in congratulating him on this significant accomplishment. And today we have the opportunity to hear directly from him about his journey. And his talk is entitled Understanding Pediatric Sarcomas, a 15-year journey. Gino, the screen is yours. Rita, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And um, I, I'm very excited to present my work today. Uh, thanks to all of you as well for taking the time to listen uh, to some of the work I've done over the last uh, 15 years, um, which when I sat down and realized it was 15 years was uh, quite sobering, actually. I have uh, no disclosures other than to say, um, I still don't really understand pediatric sarcomas. I, I have a much greater appreciation for their complexity, um, their classification, their pathology, and a little bit about their biology. Uh, but they're a fascinating group of tumors. And I hope to impart some of that fascination uh, to you all today. Um, a little bit about me, I, I think uh, Rita has summarized this um, quite nicely. Uh, I Just to add that I did my Pediatric Pathology Fellowship at University of Toronto, finished in 2004 uh, before I took up the staff position at SickKids. Uh, and here is a, a, a relatively old photo of SickKids on the left. Um, this bridge is no longer here. They're building a new um, patient support center across the street. Um, some lovely photos of University of Toronto campus along this middle strip. And this is where I come from, the University of Melbourne. And the architecture, very similar, sort of mid to late 1800s, lots of stone, lots of archways uh, and bell towers. Uh, and a, um, it, we, we take our sport very seriously in Australia. This is a cricket ground in the middle of the campus. So, um, Lots of similarities between the two universities and uh, very much enjoyed uh, working the last several years at U of T. So my talk is going to um, encompass the research that I did initially into sarcomas, my 
pivot into test development and some of the future directions that we're looking at um, currently that are really exciting in sarcoma development uh, and sarcoma test uh, assays. And embedded within my journey, I want to sort of impart three valuable lessons and uh, I will highlight them as I go through my talk. One of them is that from small things, big things grow. And you, you'll see how from a relatively um, small uh, focus, my research grew into a much larger entity. Um, small things or small changes can make big impact. And, and I'll show you an example of that. And um, the last lesson there is you have to learn to surf. And I'll explain that. I'm going to leave a little bit of mystery there so that you have motivation to see my talk till the end. And you'll see what I mean by that as we move through the talk. So firstly, let's talk a little bit about um, my research into pediatric sarcomas and how it really started um, back when I was a fellow. So when I was a fellow in 2003, we received uh, a, a tumor from a 16 year old girl. The tumor on imaging showed uh, a central necrosis and it in, had invaded into the peritoneal cavity and numerous core biopsies were performed. And this was then followed by some treatment and an excisional biopsy. And this is the excisional biopsy here. You can see hemorrhage, necrosis, and invasion of that tumor uh, through the abdominal wall. This is the uh, peritoneal cavity here. You can see how it's invaded into there. Microscopically, the tumor was composed of two types of cells. There were these Ewing's-like cells, lots of small round blue cells closely packed no real differentiation to speak of. And then these paler cells that were a little bit nested. So a really interesting, almost biphasic tumor. We did a lot of work on this tumor to try and diagnose it, to give it a name, but we were unable to, no matter how much uh, biomarkers we threw at it and how many uh, genetic tests we did, we really couldn't give it uh, a specific diagnosis. So we ended up um, writing it up, as you do, in, in a case that's this interesting. And it was because we couldn't give it a specific name, we, the, the, the term we used was, was quite descriptive, uh, subcutaneous primitive neuroectodermal tumor. Uh, and it had a very unusual carrier type. That, that was all we knew. It had, it had lots of changes in the genome that we didn't really know how to put it together. So we wrote it up as a case report, it got published, and uh, it was the, really the beginning of my journey into sarcomas. And, you know, although we've given it lots of fancy names, at the end of the day, this is really uh, a sarcoma. And sort of therein, my interest in pediatric sarcomas began. And um, pediatric sarcomas, uh, are tumors of connective tissue. So really they can occur anywhere in the body from literally the scalp down to the toe. And I've seen sarcomas in all sites uh, through the body because everywhere there's connective tissue, sarcomas can arise. Um, they're proportionally more common in children. And, and by that, I mean, if you look at how many, um, all the cancers that occur in children, percentage wise, sarcomas have a much higher uh, percentage in children than they do in adults. There's still more sarcomas in adults because there's more adults than children. But for some reason, children seem to be prone to, to developing sarcomas. They are aggressive. They require extensive surgery, lots of chemotherapy. Uh, and for that chemotherapy to be appropriate, they, they require accurate diagnosis. And that's where obviously me as a pathologist uh, comes into the picture. The sarcomas in children often have very diagnostic uh, rearrangements in the genome that we can use to accurately diagnose and to guide treatment. And that was something that was missing in that first tumor that I showed you. And again, how my interest started. 
just some sarcomas. This is a, a, a very common pediatric sarcoma called Ewing sarcoma with lots of closely packed cells, very similar to that case report I showed you. Um, it has lots of glycogen and it marks very positively for an antibody called CD99. Um, the, the defining feature of Ewing sarcoma is the rearrangement so that the EWS gene on chromosome 22 uh, gets transposed or translocated to another gene called FLY1 in most cases on chromosome 11. We didn't have that in that first tumor, so we couldn't make that diagnosis. And this is another pediatric sarcoma called um, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma just to give you a sense of what they look like down the microscope. This has a, a very uh, unique alveolar type architecture. And the first pathologist to look at this back in the 30s thought it kind of looked a little bit like alveoli in uh, lung tissue. So the term alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma was, was born. So I got really interested in um, not just sarcoma, but specifically uh, undifferentiated sarcomas. It looks like sarcomas that we, that looks like we um, diagnose, <laughs> like that first case report I showed. And um, my journey then kind of started by looking at pediatric undifferentiated soft tissue sarcomas. And these sarcomas, as opposed to the two I just showed you, the, the Ewing's, the alveolar rhabdos, and many other subtypes, you can't classify them. And that means that it's difficult to give it, uh, obviously, a diagnostic name. And it's kind of difficult for the clinicians to know how to treat them if you can't diagnose them. They, they give them the most aggressive therapy possible, just in case it is an aggressive sarcoma. But that's not no, the not ideal situation. So we um, uh, uh, did, what we did was we got together uh, a series of um, pediatric undifferentiated sarcomas. Uh, we looked through our archives and came up with, uh, I'm just going to see if I can mute this person. I'm just going gonna, gonna to recommend everybody to mute as soon as they join so that um, uh, we can, uh, I, I'm not too distracted. Um, so we went through our archive and found 13 cases of undifferentiated sarcomas that none of us could diagnose uh, or come up with a name for. And we put together the series, 13 cases, and we found that um, there was one main morphologic pattern, as in there was one pattern of sarcomas down the microscope, there's one morphologic pattern that seemed to crop up a lot more than, than any other pattern. And that was that closely packed uh, cellular um, small round blue cell pattern that I showed you on that very first uh, case, that, that, that undifferentiated sarcoma, that first case. Um, the challenge with these sarcomas is that they don't have any diagnostic biomarkers and there's no recurrent rearrangements that we could find in this series of 13. So we published it and uh, it got um, uh, published in our society journal, the Society for Pediatric Pathologies journal called Pediatric and Developmental Pathology. Uh, and that was, that was a really uh, interesting beginning for me because I didn't realize how common these were. There were actually, uh, as I said, 13 of these cases in our archives uh, and probably more now, obviously. And this is kind of what they look like. You can see most of them look like this, these very closely packed um, cells that form really no discernible differentiation. Uh, some of them had quite uh, noticeable dilated blood vessels. Um, and this is what they look like on high power, a little bit of pleomorphism, as in the cells look quite different to each other, uh, but predominantly monomorphic. And then there was occasional other patterns, but it was predominantly these small round blue cells that formed sheets that we found. So my main interest in these undifferentiated sarcomas was how do we diagnose them? How do we give the clinicians an idea 
as to what is biologically driving these sarcomas so that they can better treat them and even look for targeted therapy uh, as we uh, move into precision medicine. The other thing, uh, the other thing I looked for was uh, how do we consider them from a biological standpoint, and that was something um, that we did as well. But I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into that. I, I want to focus on uh, just the diagnostic uh, angle, and um, to do this, we then asked for funding, and we got some startup money from um, the university. Uh, through the Dean's Fund, and we got some startup money through the Hospital for Sick Children, and we were able to, to do some studies. And we looked predominantly at chromosomal and DNA abnormalities, because as I said, many paediatric sarcomas have diagnostic uh, rearrangements that you can um, use to give it a name, to give it a diagnosis. So my theory was that these undifferentiated sarcomas must have something that we just haven't discovered yet that we can use to diagnose and, and provide a better understanding of where they've come from. And we put together um, the carrier types because a lot of these cases were from the late 90s and early 2000s. And this is in the days before uh, Next-gen sequencing was available. It was really the, the days of, of RT-PCR and FISH. And they were powerful techniques, but they were not useful if you didn't know what to look for. That you couldn't sort of go use them as a, as a fishing expedition, like some of the NGS techniques you, you, you can use now. So we looked at the carrier types and we found that um, there was uh, a recurrent site on the chromosome on chromosome 19 that was rearranged here in in patient number two there was a 19 q13 and here in patient number three there was also a 19 q13 so that gave us a sense that there might be a gene in that region that's driving uh, a good percentage of these undifferentiated sarcomas we then went from um, the carrier type, which is a fairly crude method looking at rearrangements. Um, it, it doesn't really give you a fine readout of the genes involved. So we went from that to um, uh, comparative genomic hybridization, which gives you a sense of um, the copy numbers of the, the genes. And what we found uh, was that these rearrangements the ones involving chromosome 19 were unbalanced, which was great because then we could pick it up on the CGH array, the, the chromosome, the genomic hybridization technique, comparative genomic hybridization. We we're able to pick up the actual gene that was involved. And what we found, uh, we, we made some probes and we found here the sick gene on uh, chromosome uh, 19, sick gene here on chromosome 19, was the gene that was consistently rearranged in these sarcomas. The, the gene on chromosome 4 we thought was DUX4, but we were, we were sort of honing in on it with finer and finer studies when um, a group in Japan actually published a series of adults with sick and ducks four. And um, as kind of disappointing as that was, they had published um, an RT-PCR test that would pick these up, that would pick up the sick ducks four fusion transcript. So we used it on our tumors. We, we, um, we made the primers and we used it. And sure enough, we had uh, two, two, three, four, five additional cases of these tumors that had the sick ducks for gene rearrangement and the first to be described in children. Uh, and it was, although it was a little disappointing that we weren't the first, we were a very close second 
and we found that uh, these these rearrangements are very variable. So the the tumors, uh, although the genes are in, that are involved are the same, the actual breakpoints are very different. The, the, the exons are different and there's lots of repeat sequences. So it was a quite a, a fascinating uh, a discovery that although the genes are the same, the breakpoints are different. And we found, um, uh, we published a number of papers on this. Uh, we found a number of other abnormalities in these tumors. And we also found that um, by looking at the, the clinical uh, outcome of these patients, these are more aggressive than the most aggressive tumor that we'd known up till then, which was Ewing sarcoma, number one. And number two, for some reason, these patients have a high propensity for these sarcomas to metastasize to the, the brain, which is for sarcomas pretty uncommon. So there's something in that SICDUX4 fusion transcript that drives these cells to metastasize um, to the brain. So I just wanted to, this is, this is kind of the, where my first valuable lesson um, comes from. From that very first case report of an undifferentiated sarcoma that we couldn't name and couldn't find any biomarkers, uh, we grew a project and you know, it wasn't just me, it was a lot of other people that were, that were helping me along the way and, and, and my team in the lab that were instrumental in growing this project from a single case report to uh, you know, a funded uh, uh, grant project that ended up discovering a new subtype of pediatric sarcomas with a very aggressive behavior and a propensity for CNS metastases. And that allowed then the clinicians to, um, we were able to you know, seed out these tumors whenever we get an undifferentiated sarcoma and provide uh, aggressive treatment because that's what they need. So one of the things that I realized, and this is kind of where I'm gonna pivot a little into test development, but one of the things I realized as I was doing the project, looking at the undifferentiated sarcomas, was that they're really difficult to diagnose. And um, it was really, it took us five years from the beginning of that case report through to discovering the SICDUX4 and publishing a diagnostic assay for them. It, it, it was a five or six year journey. And it was great to be able to diagnose and provide an assay. But the challenge was that um, there were many other undifferentiated sarcomas that didn't have that transcript. And it is expensive to go through single PCR tests, single fish tests. Uh, you deplete tissue and you use up a lot of consumables and time. So we wanted to uh, diagnose, uh, we wanted to find a test that would be able to find a lot of these transcripts at the same time. And that, that was what drove me then into test development um, and uh, better ways of diagnosing pediatric sarcomas. So when I first sat down and, and decided that we have to develop a better way to test sarcomas, these were the needs. We, we, we um, as we kind of develop better ways of biopsying, the, the amount of biopsy tissue gets smaller. It allows for faster recovery and it's much less uh, sort of morbid for the child to undergo tiny needle biopsies than the big incisional biopsies we used to get. So it needs to be able to use small amounts of tissue. The assay needs to be what's called multiplexed, which means that it should be able to test for multiple abnormalities at the same time. It should be able to be used on paraffin embedded formal and fixed tissue, because a lot of the tissues in our archives and a lot of the uh, tissues that we get from outside of sick kids, this is how they're given to us in, in paraffin. So that's a challenge in itself to get good quality nucleic acid, particularly RNA, out of formal and fixed tissue. 
and it should be able to be read with fairly minimal bioinformatics um, for you know the likes of someone like myself who's not a bioinformatician and doesn't have a lot of time to read through a lot of results and a lot of different sort of variants and so on. We, we want a fairly simple readout to make a diagnosis. So back in around 2010, 2012, when we started this project, uh, the two main diagnostic methods we used at SickKids was a fish assay, which is basically a probe that you um, look for a, a gene that's broken apart, uh, and an RT-PCR, which literally amplifies two genes that are stuck together uh, as a band, and you see the band there on the, on the gel. Um, I remember distinctly when nanostring was first mentioned to me, it was Dr. Cynthia Hawkins, who's a neuropathologist here and a wonderful resource for innovation. She said, you know, do you think um, the fusion transcripts could be detected by nanostring? Because at the time nanostring was used for uh, looking at gene expression, but it hadn't yet been used to detect fusion transcripts, which are essentially just a different kind of gene. And it got me thinking, I thought, well, yeah, it probably could be used for uh, diagnostic purposes for detecting these fusion transcripts where one gene is stuck to another. And it had lots of advantages. I don't want to bore you with the detail, but it certainly um, used small amounts of tissue. Uh, you could use it off of paraffin. You could detect over 200 targets if you really wanted to in a single assay. It was relatively cheap, it had a fast turnaround time, and the bioinformatics were minimal. It almost sounded too good to be true, but this was the technique that, this is why we got so excited about it. And this was the, um, the diagnostic test development that we, we put a lot of effort into. And it's a, it doesn't, it uses RNA from the tumor. Uh, you, you add several probes to that RNA mix and it uh, will only detect and report if you have a fusion transcript. And this is a little bit of the mechanics. This is uh, the reporter tag. This is the capture tag where it sits on the plate that gets read by the, by the scanner. And this is the fusion gene. This is, let's say, um, uh, the EWS gene on chromosome 22 juxtaposed to the FLY1 gene on chromosome 11. And it picks up that fusion transcript and it reads it and it's a, it's a, a wonderfully clean result uh, or, or so we were hoping. And we, we, we applied this to uh, three different pediatric sarcomas as a pilot project because it was, we really needed to prove that it worked before we applied for more funding. And we did it on three sarcoma entities uh, around 12 fusion transcripts. And we use lots of different uh, types of tissue uh, and a small amount of RNA, 200 nanograms is, is very small. So it, it was very sensitive as well. And a lot, all the samples we used had been proven before. And the initial pilot worked. So we expanded it, we got some money, we, we did a lot more tumors and we, we came up with a lot more um, fusion probes. And we found that <clears throat> this is the results that we got uh, from that sort of initial uh, investment in time and money. And you can see here, the readout is beautifully clear. Uh, lots of dots, uh, these are all positive tumors. Um, so six out of six of the synovial sarcomas with the, uh, with the, the specific fusion transcript um, was positive. Ewing sarcoma, again, lots of different fusion transcripts. The only two that failed was because of poor RNA quality, but again, very accurate um, readout. And the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, five out of five, it was wonderful. But we found a problem and it was a fairly major problem. Um, it was great, like I said, it worked, uh, it detects fusions, but the problem was that the initial probe design didn't allow us to detect the partner. So we knew there was an EWS fusion transcript, but we didn't know what the partner was. And that's critical at making a diagnosis. And what we'd actually 
made, we'd spent lots of time and money, um, thousands of dollars on developing this test. And what we'd actually designed was literally a glorified fish test. So it was very disappointing to realize the design was flawed. And I spent several sleepless nights trying to think a way out of it. And we were sitting, I was sitting one day with the design team from Nanostring uh, and um, our lab specialist here. And they said, you know what? I think I've got the answer. And it was, we would, we were just sort of, I guess you could say spitballing. And we realized that if you just shifted this probe, the reporter probe, a little bit so that you had a little bit of the sequence of the partner, it would work. And this is literally what we did. I'm gonna do it again, because it's just, to me, this is wonderful design um, uh, principle. We just shifted probe A so that it included a little bit of the partner gene. And then we we're able to differentiate all the different partners that the EWS gene stuck to. And that's really important for diagnosis and it's really important for treatment. And what we found was that small changes do actually make a huge impact. And this, I think this is a life lesson, um, not just for research, but remember it throughout life as well. We made the change. The results were wonderful. We were able to differentiate a lot of different sarcomas. We were able to, to know what that partner gene was. Um, and we finally had a wonderful assay that we're able to publish just recently uh, as um, a you know, diagnostic sarcoma test. Um, we have now around 34 separate transcripts that we can detect uh, in the assay. Uh, it's clinically licensed. It's the first licensed test of its kind. Uh, and it has a very short turnaround time and it's been operational for around five years. Uh, we also have used it now for um, lots of different brain tumor diagnostic assays, including expression gene analysis for medullar blastoma subtyping and fusion detection for many of the glioma subtypes. And we do also have a diagnostic test for leukemia and all its um, variant translocations. So it's a very powerful technique. And I was really proud to be able to be part of that team to show it worked for the first time on fusion transcripts. And this is kind of our approach now to the, um, the diagnostics that we use for sarcomas. You can see that for pathologists, the morphology is still incredibly important. And it's obviously the first thing we look at when we're trying to diagnose these sarcomas. It gives us a very strong sense of what we're dealing with. So morphology is really important in sarcoma. Uh, diagnosis. We then do some immunostains, looking at the proteins that these sarcomas express, including CD99, let's say for Ewing sarcoma, or muscle markers for rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a tumor of, you know, it, it, it recapitulates striated muscle development. It just forms a tumor. Uh, or synovial sarcoma, where they express cytokeratins. Um, our first tier of molecular testing includes nanostring and fish. Um, the nanostring will pick up a lot of the common transcripts and fusion genes. And the fish test, ironically, the very first fusion transcript I dis discovered with the SickDux4 doesn't work on nanostring and we have to still use the fish test um, to diagnose these uh, sarcomas, the, the sick rearranged sarcomas. And then if we're still struggling with a, with a diagnosis for these sarcomas, we move to the second tier, uh, which includes next generation sequencing, uh, such as a whole genome or whole exome, RNA-seq, and uh, sometimes SNP analysis can help as well, looking at those um, copy number changes. So I'm getting to the um, end. Uh, these are some future directions that I think are pretty exciting. We are working on getting uh, mutational analysis for these sarcomas. And, and a lot of these sarcomas now, 
we're finding are harboring mutations that allow us to even better classify them, even better uh, target treatment, uh, and uh, really gives us a glimpse into what's driving them. So some of these we're using uh, digital droplet PCR, some of them we're using um, RNA-seq to find. The second uh, future direction you see there <clears throat> is 3D assays. And that's where we can, um, with the nanostring assay, we can look at um, DNA, RNA and protein expression simultaneously. So there could well be a day where you extract um, all the, the protein, the RNA and the DNA, and you feed it into uh, the assay and at the other end, you get protein expression data such as CD99. You get the RNA analysis for the transcript and you get DNA analysis for the mutation all in the one assay. And I think that's a, an incredibly powerful tool that uh, currently, uh, again, Dr. Cynthia Hawkins is working up um, for the brain tumors and we're hoping to do the same for the sarcomas. And the last future direction is methylation profiling, which is uh, something that we've got sort of a two-year plan for, which will be really exciting. And we'll see if that helps us better diagnose, again, these sarcomas and some other solid tumors. Now, those future directions are great, but COVID happened, um, what is it, 10, almost 11 months ago. And that really put a halt to certainly a lot of my academic activity, given um, the, I guess, the change in priorities. Uh, a lot of what I do at the hospital was focused on um, making sure we were following protocols, uh, getting tissue handling, um, SOPs organized, how do we handle autopsies. So a lot of the things that I was doing academically uh, slowed down. They didn't stop, but they certainly slowed down. And this is where I wanna say, this is the last few slides, have, learn to surf. So uh, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's a, a professor emeritus from the University of Massachusetts, has this wonderful saying, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And I think one of the, the things I wanna impart is that to, to be successful in academic medicine, you do have to have a degree of adaptability. And I think COVID has definitely shown us that. And my adaptability, I've taken on a, more, a greater role in wellness, both at the hospital and the university. And I, I was into wellness before COVID, but it's taken on a greater role as the academic work slowed down. And then I'm hoping as the academic work picks up, the wellness will still be there, but there'll be a little bit more of a balanced approach between my academic work and my wellness work as well. And that is the last lesson, and that's where I'm going to end. Thank you very much, everybody, and I'm happy to hand it over to Rita now and take some questions. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk and those uh, pearls of advice for our um, learners. Uh, Again, just to remind people uh, to please put your questions in the chat. There are so many attendees at this um, seminar. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to see the raised hands. And while people are thinking about their questions, perhaps I'll ask a question, Gino. Um, you mentioned, if I understood you correctly, about a, an abundant chromosomal changes in these tumors in addition to the fusion transcript. Do you think that those other changes have any effect on, on the biology of the disease? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I think that, you know, what we found um, was that in, in many pediatric sarcomas where you have a fusion transcript, the usual pattern is that you have a fairly clean genome. So you have the rearrangement and then you really don't have much else going on in the genome. However, in these more aggressive tumors, we're finding that the genome is a little more complicated than that. And I think the more in-depth analyses we do, the more complicated rearrangements we're finding within the tumors. Uh, so I do think that certainly 
if you have lots of rearrangements, it definitely plays a role in the aggressiveness of these tumors. So I, I, my feeling is that um, as you add rearrangements and abnormalities and, and gains and losses, the tumor tends to increase in its aggressive behavior. So uh, absolutely, I think those additional changes do play a role. know if anybody has any other questions. I've got a question here from um, Ben. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Why do you think that the sarcomas have such high diverse molecular profiles? Do you think it's related to where they're localized? Um, that's a really good question, Ben. I actually, I don't think it's so much related to where they're localized. I think it's probably more related to the, the cell of origin. And I think that we know that in certain sarcoma subtypes, for example, um, osteosarcoma, they have an incredibly complex um, genome, lots of changes, lots of abnormalities. Uh, and that supposed cell of origin is an osteoblast. Whereas um, Ewing sarcoma, where the supposed cell of origin is, is a sort of primitive stem cell or primitive sort of neuroectodermal stem cell, there's a very clean genome usually. And I think because it's a different cell of origin, there's a different biology and a different thing that's driving it, which is the, the fusion transcript. So my feeling is it's more related to the cell of origin than it is the, the actual location. It, it is an interesting point because in, in some tumors, in some tumors of the CNS, the location, even if the subtype is the same, the location will have specific molecular profiles associated with it. So far for the sarcomas, we haven't seen a, a at least I haven't seen a report looking at location and the, the profiles according to location. I don't think that plays such a big role. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll have uh, ask another question. Uh, very intriguing that these tumors seem to metastasize to the CNS, which is a, a very unusual for sarcomas. And is there any um, understanding of why that predilection may occur? No, actually, it's a good point because it, we um, I'm part of a group of uh, pathologists that are looking at sarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas in, in children. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of us across North America. There's about five or six of us in the group. And as part of that group, there's a, an oncologist who has collected these sick ducts for sarcomas or sick rearranged sarcomas, as we call them. And she said that um, there's, they don't know why. And, and she's done some biological studies on these tumors. She said she still doesn't know why there's such a predilection for these tumors to go to the CNS. And, and that case that I showed you, that very first case report that had a sick ducts for rearrangement, um, that unfortunate patient died of cranial and intracranial metastases. So there's, there has to be something maybe a cell receptor or, or something to do with the, the genetics um, that causes these cells to, I guess, zone into the, the, the CNS and, and grow. Um, but we don't know, and it's early days yet. We're trying to look at uh, the reasons behind it. Okay, thank you. We have a question here from Ling Jin. Um, Thanking you for the great talk. Uh, as more uh, and more novel fusions are discovered, um, there has not been a consistent way to correlate the fusions to tumor behavior and targeted treatment. What is your insight on this? Yeah, I think that's, a, again, that's a really insightful question, uh, Ling Jin. I, the, in the early days, um, when we found these fusion transcripts, uh, the thought was that you could target the pathways that those fusion transcripts 
um, uh, drove to increase activity to treat the tumour. And what we found pretty quickly, you know, or what, not me, but what researchers found pretty quickly was that you could, you could inhibit one pathway, but it found another pathway in which to act through. And I think that we have to be careful that uh, we don't think of cancer as, you know, a one mutation or one rearrangement disease. I think that there's a lot of, and it goes back to uh, Professor Candle's first question, you know, it goes back to all the other rearrangements that are in that tumor as well. I think we have to be, um, I guess, uh, aware that there are a lot of pathways that are activated in any sarcoma and they're, no, that's right. while there might be one predominant pathway, I think there's lots of other pathways we have to uh, also be um, cognizant of. So I, I feel that um, it, the, the, the diagnostic fusion transcript is great for diagnosis, but we can't fool ourselves into thinking that just targeting that fusion transcript will treat the sarcoma. We have to look at other ways and other pathways as well to stop the growth. Uh, we have another question from Ranju. Um, compared to carcinomas, do you find a difference in vascularization in sarcomas that make it more aggressive? <laughs> it's a, 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 again, Ranju, great question. I haven't seen a carcinoma for a long time. <laughs> we don't get many at, um, at sick kids, but definitely uh, sarcomas, tend to spread in a different way to, to carcinomas. And I think that um, for sarcomas, spread to lymph nodes is pretty uncommon, whereas in carcinomas, it tends to be very common. And sarcomas tend to spread usually via the, the bloodborne route. So they tend to go to liver and lung, and as we discussed before, um, CNS. So I don't know whether they're more vascularized, but they definitely have a greater propensity to spread via the bloodstream than they do via the lymphatic channels of carcinomas. Good question. And we have another question from Ling Jin. Um, we've been talking a lot about genes, um, mRNA fusion transcripts. What do you think about, what do you think the role of proteomics, proteomics, sorry, um, is in providing opportunities for more targeted therapy. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we would really love to do with this 3D assay is look at the pathways that are activated in a single tumor. So not just look at the, um, the, the fusion transcript, but look at uh, what are the, you know, th there's there's several pathways that can be activated in a, um, uh, a sarcoma. And by developing probes for each of those different pathways, we can see which of the pathways are overexpressed, as in over sort of active, and which are not. And I think by, by having that 3D approach, uh, which includes proteomics, absolutely. By having that 3D approach, we can actually find which targeted treatments work uh, in certain settings. And the other powerful tool of that is that uh, we can look at tumors, uh, we can go back to our archive, we can look at tumors that have responded to treatment, and we can look at tumors that haven't responded to treatment and see what's the difference in the pathway activation? And perhaps in those tumors that hadn't responded to treatment, there's a pathway or several pathways that haven't been targeted, that are overactive, that we could then target. So I feel that with the advent um, absolutely of proteomics and 3D assays and, and sort of much more uh, holistic look at the cancer itself, uh, we'll be able to provide uh, more effective and more targeted treatment. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of the hour. I uh, want to um, congratulate you once again on this accomplishment. It is clearly well-deserved. And thank you. Um, thank you for this great talk. Thank you, Gino. Thank you very much, Rita. Thank you, everybody.